The Book of Disquiet by Fernando Pessoa 10. Futile and sensitive, I'm capable of violent and consuming impulses, both good and bad, noble and vile, but never of a sentiment that endures, never of an emotion that continues, entering to the substance of my soul. Everything in me tends to go on to become something else. My soul is impatient with itself, as with a bothersome child. Its restlessness keeps growing and is forever the same. Everything interests me, but nothing holds me. I attend to everything, dreaming all the while. I note the slightest facial movements of the person I'm talking with. I record the subtlest inflections of his utterances, but I hear without listening. I'm thinking of something else. And what I least catch in the conversation is the sense of what was said by me or by him. And I so often repeat to someone what I've already repeated or ask him again what he's already answered. But I'm able to describe in four photographic words the facial muscles he used to say what I don't recall or the way he listened with his eyes to the words I don't remember telling him. I'm too and both keep their distance. Siamese twins that aren't attached. 11. Litany. We never know self-realization. We are two abysses, a well staring at the sky. 12. I envy, but I'm not sure that I envy those for whom a biography could be written or who could write their own. In these random impressions and with no desire to be other than random, I indifferently narrate my factless autobiography, my lifeless history. These are my confessions, and if in them I say nothing, it's because I have nothing to say. What is there to confess that's worthwhile or useful? What has happened to us has happened to everyone or only to us. If to everyone, then it's no novelty. And if only to us, then it won't be understood. If I write what I feel, it's to reduce the fever of feeling. What I confess is unimportant because everything is unimportant. I make landscapes out of what I feel. I make holidays of my sensations. I can easily understand women who embroider out of sorrow or who crochet because life exists. My elderly aunt would play solitaire throughout the endless evening. These confessions of what I feel are my solitaire. I don't interpret them like those who read guards to tell the future. I don't probe them because in solitaire the cards don't have any special significance. I unwind myself like a multicolored skein. Or I make string figures of myself like those woven on spread fingers and passed from child to child. I take care only that my thumb not miss its loop. Then I turn over my hand and the figure changes and I start over. To live is to crochet according to a pattern we were given, but while doing it, the mind is at liberty and all enchanted princes can stroll in their parks between one and another plunge of the hooked ivory needle. Needlework of things, intervals, nothing. Besides, what can I expect from myself, my sensations in all their horrible acuity, and a profound awareness of feeling, a sharp mind that only destroys me, and an unusual capacity for dreaming to keep me entertained, a dead will, and a reflection that cradles it like a living child. Yes. Crochet. Thirteen. My deplorable condition isn't in the least affected by these words. I join together to form, little by little, my haphazard book of musings. My worthless self lives on, at the bottom of every expression, like an indissoluble residue at the bottom of a glass, from which only water was drunk. I write my literature as I write my letter entries, 
carefully and indifferently next to the vast starry sky and the enigma of so many souls, the night of the unknown abyss and the chaos nothing making sense. Next to all this, what I write in the ledger and what I write on this paper that tells my soul are equally confined to the Rua dos Duradores, woefully little, in the face of the universe's millionaire expanses. All of this is dream and phantasmagoria, and it matters little whether the dream be of ledger entries or of well-crafted prose. Does dreaming of princesses serve a better purpose than dreaming of the front door to the office? All that we know is our own impression, and all that we are is an exterior impression, a melodrama in which we, the self-aware actors, are also our own spectators, our own gods by permission of some department or other at City Hall. 14. We may know that the work we continue to put off doing will be bad. Worse, however, is the work we never do. A work that's finished is at least finished. It may be poor, but it exists, like the miserable plant in the lone flower pot of my neighbor who's crippled. That plant is her happiness, and sometimes it's even mine. What I write, bad as it is, may provide some hurt or sad soul a few moments of distraction from something worse. That's enough for me, or it isn't enough, but it serves some purpose, and so it is with all of life. A tedium that includes the expectation of nothing but more tedium. A regret, right now, for the regret I'll have tomorrow, for having felt regret today. Huge confusions with no point and no truth. Huge confusions. We're curled up on a bench in a railway station. My contempt dozes in the cloak of my discouragement. The world of dreamed images, which are the sum of my knowledge, as well as of my life. To heed the present moment isn't a great or lasting concern of mine. I crave time in all its duration. I want to bury myself unconditionally. 15. Inch by inch, I conquer the inner terrain I was born with. Bit by bit, I reclaim the swamp in which I had languished. I gave birth to my infinite being, but I had to wrench myself out of me with forceps. 16. I daydream between Cascais and Lisbon. I went to Cascais to pay a property tax for my boss, Senor Vasquez, on a house he owns in Estoril. I took anticipated pleasure in the trip, an hour each way in which to enjoy the forever changing views of the wide river and its Atlantic estuary. But on actually going out there, I lost myself in abstract contemplations, seeing but not seeing the riverscapes I'd looked forward to seeing. While on the way back, I lost myself in mentally nailing down those sensations. I wouldn't be able to describe the slightest detail of the trip, the slightest scrap of what there was to see. What I got out of it are these pages, the fruit of contradiction and forgetting. I don't know if this is better or worse than the contrary, nor do I know what the contrary is. The train slows down. We're at Cai do Sodre. I've arrived at Lisbon, but not at a conclusion. 17. Perhaps it's finally time for me to make this one effort, to take a good look at my life. I see myself in the midst of a vast desert. I tell what I literarily was yesterday. And I try to explain to myself how I got here.